Hello and welcome once again to the Games of Foot, where I sit and play a wide variety of Sherlock Holmes video games. Um, this is part four, five. It's 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 been a minute. Um, we're playing uh, the Lost Files of Sherlock Holmes, uh, which was a 1982 Electronic Arts game, um, and we're pretty close to the end at this point. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that we have been running into, well, I'm running into, I should say, um, has been the fact that uh, this is an older school adventure game, so sometimes it does rely on you to select a very specific thing in a very specific order, and it's, it's not always clear exactly what that thing might be. Um, so, uh, last couple times we got a little stuck, um, but uh, I think I've looked things through. Um, as, as always, uh, uh, we have uh, the super handy uh, clue book uh, that was originally released. I have a PDF version of that now available. What's something wrong with my beard? I don't know what's going on with that. Um, uh, but um, we have that available to help us out. And also, this time, I also do have a walkthrough on speed dial, as it were. Um, something else that happened last time that I want to kind of dig into a little bit. Um, uh, the last time, actually, I think the last couple of times, um, some people in the chat were actually very helpful um, and dug up some walkthroughs and gave me, fed me some clues to kind of get me to certain places, which was usually helpful. Um, but a lot of times, um, what would happen is they would jump ahead to a certain section of the walkthrough uh, and say, we need to do X, and then nothing would happen. Um, and I think a lot of the reason why that occurred is because... Um, earlier actions weren't taken in the right order. Um, so in a, a more modern uh, adventure game, um, you can't get to the section of the game before you take those actions, where in this kind of game, it's very wide open. And so it is very possible to get to a relatively late stage of the game, um, but not be able to progress because some earlier stage, it was unclear what you actually need to do. Um, and from a design perspective, uh, I want to make it super clear, that was actually intentional. Uh, in, the, in these kind of 90s, late 80s era games, replayability was found, or I should say length of gameplay was found by giving you a lot to kind of sift through. Um, so you have lots of different things to explore and try out, especially in the late game, um, and then try to figure out what is the piece you're missing. Um, that was considered compelling gameplay in 1992. It is not now. Uh, so uh, that's why... Um, uh, for this in particular, but probably throughout this series, um, I have no shame in uh, using uh, uh, walkthroughs and clues to try to figure out what's going on because, you know, it's not really entertaining to watch me sit for two hours and click through every single thing I've done before to figure out the one thing I need to do. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the old handy scum MV. I'm going to load right into this um, to kind of show you what actually happens here. Um, last time, again, it looked like we got very far, and I realized after reading the walkthrough that um, I had been here before, and this is the taxidermist. Um, but what I did not do was click on this knife here. You will notice this is literally four pixels, um, and only a couple of them are glowing or changing color. So because I didn't click on this little tiny thing, a whole bunch of stuff opens up. This knife can easily be mistaken for a surgeon's scalpel or not for the fact that the blade is slightly longer and its cutting edge is serrated, presumably to saw through an animal's hide. And uh, for those who remember way back at the beginning of the game, um, the woman was, our victim was killed by a serrated scalpel. So now that I've looked at that, I could talk to the, uh, the assistant to the taxidermist, who's named Lars, and you see now we have a new yellow Terminology. What is this knife used for? Well, it's not for slicing roast beef. Please be careful. It's extremely sharp. I use it for separating skin from the soft tissue beneath it, among other things. I believe a knife like this was used to kill Miss Carraway. Perhaps this very knife. And again, um, something last time I didn't do, uh, I'm going to kind of read it here, is that um, I finished that conversation. I have to click on it again to see if any new conversations have since shown up. Um, and I have to keep doing it until every single conversation is gray. And even then, I may have to go back to people once other things have been locked or clues have been found with new information. Your situation is serious, Mr. Sorensen. I see you as charged as an accessory to murder if you don't assist me. It's urgent I find Mr. Blackwood. 
No need to threaten me, Mr. Holmes. I'll tell you what I know. I overheard Blackwood making an appointment to meet someone at the Surrey Commercial Docks. That's a huge area. Can't you be more specific? Sorry, that's all I know, except that knife there belongs to Blackwood. Give us a brief description of Blackwood, if you would. He is of medium build with gray hair. He wears a top hat and a monocle. So now we have a description of Blackwood. Now I want to double check. Um, there's a couple things I want to make sure I have here. Uh, Snuff box, diary, coloring card, pulse caps, mock, beach of Okay, cool. Um, and now I have a good sense of what we need to do next. Um, so let's go to the docks. Which I'm guessing is probably by the river. Maybe? That's the mansion. Uh, hmm. Okay. Scotland Yard, Covent Gardens, Opera House. Make sure I'm not looking at somewhere else. And as you can see, uh, for people who haven't played or have been watching earlier, um, there are now a lot of locations. It goes back to my earlier point is if, if I were not using a walkthrough, I'd have to go through every single one of these locations. Um, but I'm going to actually go back here real quick because something else we have learned in this version of the game, at least, or in this game, um, is that Watson sometimes gets information. Watson, would you not describe this knife as a serrated scalpel? I would indeed, Holmes. I've never seen an instrument like it. How can we effectively scour the scurry commercial, Surrey commercial docks for Blackwood? Perhaps the redoubtable canine Toby can help. Indeed, Watson, he might just be able to pick up Mr. Blackwood's scent. Watson, what do you make of the animals here? Definitely the same workmanship as the moose we saw in the tobacco shop, Holmes. If nothing else, this Blackwood is an artist worthy of his craft. Okay, so let's go find Toby. Um, Toby is an interesting part of the Holmes canon. Uh, old Germans. Okay. Um, so, um, talk about Toby for a second. Toby is great. Toby is wonderful. Um, Toby was, uh, is a dog. Um, and, uh, because this game is created or written by people who clearly are very, very passionate about the original Sherlock Holmes canon, um, they were going to find Toby at Old Sherman's, um, which is, uh, a location that what uh, Holmes has some familiarity with, um, and he's used Toby on previous unknown cases before the two cases we actually see in the original canon. And he is a redoubtable bloodhound, a redoubtable hound, I should say. He's actually kind of a mutt, according to the canon. Um, Toby has since, much like uh, characters like uh, Mrs. Hudson, become a weirdly disproportionately um, well-known supporting character of Sherlock Holmes canon. Um, he has made his way into a wide variety of Sherlock Holmes uh, media. And in fact, in some of the later games I'll play in the series, um, Toby actually is positioned as Sherlock Holmes's dog, um, which is not canonically inaccurate, but also has more support in the canon than most people understand and believe it does. Um, so anyway, Toby's an amazing dog. I'm excited to see what Toby will allow us to do in this particular game because Toby, like Watson, is one of those characters that there's a wide variety of game mechanics and designs that can go with the use of the Toby. Um, and you know, and yeah, it was in walkthrough. It, it, it's a very small piece. I, I actually had to spend a couple of hours figuring out what was the piece I was missing. Um, so now we have uh, Mr. Sherman's, um, uh, and much like in the original uh, story, um, and I am pretty sure it is a sign of the four that Toby first appears. Um, but, uh, 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 Sherman's is, is just full of different kinds of animals, and we can just kind of see that in this interpretation. There's an owl. A large tiny owl surveys the room from a cleverly selected perch and makes his occasional inquiries. A lethal nocturnal hunter, he presumably helps keep the premises clear of unwanted rodents. His presence may account for the fact that the room is kept in a kind of twilight, lit only by the stove and whatever light passes into the shop from very dirty windows. Um, I don't know if the... Uh filth of the place is canonically accurate. It's certainly busy, but I mean, I suppose if you have a lot of animals, it's going to get dirty. And no worries, Yudan. This kind of game has lots of complex situations. 
A bad temper, though, toothless stoats snaps, snarls, and yips from inside the cage. The door is unfastened, so she presumably has the run of the place and uses the cage as her bedroom. Um, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, these, these games were very much reliant on, on very small details, and if you're playing it constantly for hours at a time, it's kind of easy to keep it in your head, but it's certainly assumed that you were keeping very careful notes. Um, and the game, this game actually has more um, in-game support, like with the journal, than other games equivalent do. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, this is definitely a game where it's meant to just be the, the game you're playing for months. Badger. Though clearly a sort of pet, this badger is hardly tame. He continuously hisses, claws the floor, and bears his teeth with anyone, including Old Sherman, comes to ten feet of him. That's a terrible pet. A sturdy empty cage. Given the condition of the shop and the appearance of Old Sherman, it is unexpected that his library contains one of the finest private collections of ornithological subjects in England. Among his treasures are an elephant folio of Audubon's The Birds of America and an exhaustive history of a balming and taxidermy by French specialist Bethier. This young, long-tailed parrot from South America is caged. Given that Sherman's other birds roam freely through the shop, it may be assumed that this macaw is either living up to a specimen's reputation for viciousness, or that Sherman is concerned that this specimen carries psittacosis. Psittacosis. Psittacosis? Psittacosis. Think, uh, your, your canine friend Toby. <laughs> I like this. Not just Toby's. Your canine friend Toby. The dog is an ungainly brown and white, long-haired, floppy-eared mongrel, half spaniel, half greyhound, with a steady eye and a waddling gait. Ooh, gait spelled wrong. That's actually the first typo I've seen. It's actually really impressive. He is known by a select few to be the best tracking dog in England and perhaps the whole of Europe. I think that's everything. All right. Let's talk to Old Sherman. Come on. Greetings, Sherman. I trust I find you well. Oh, it's you, Sherlock. What a surprise. And you've brought Dr. Watson. How nice. I hope you've paid your respects to the animals. They always like to see old friends. Readily, we're not here on a social call. We have need of your treasure's extraordinary skill. Ah, you come for Toby, then, and not a moment too soon. He's been moping around all morning. I believe he's pining for a feline friend that passed over in the great beyond. A good chase should be just a ticket for lifting his spirit. Aw, Toby lost a cat friend. I should like to borrow one, then. Thank you, old friends. Of course, Sherlock, and here, you'll need his leash. A year Dan tells me that uh, psychosis is known as parrot fever or ornithosis. is a zoonotic infectious disease in humans caused by a bacterium called chlamydia sciatica, psittacea, and contracted from infected parrots such as macaws. Okay. Um, aside from my horrible pronunciation, that sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, this game is actually really surprisingly good detail. Hello again, Sherman. Hello, Sherlock. Goodbye. Okay. Uh, let us go to Toby. I think we have to give Toby the use leash on Toby or something. But blah, blah, blah. So use leash on your canine friend, Toby. <laughs> and you know, just looked, looked it up. It's fine. <laughs> you, you can look at things online. If I can do it, you can do it. Too. It's good. And we're off. We're now at the docks. Conveniently. I don't know why he's in there, Watson. I'll stake my life on it. I've never known Toby to err. I don't know why it's something cut to here, but okay, Toby just kind of, it is locked. Look at ground one floor. Queen Victoria was still in nappies when this window was last cleaned. The urban soot and grime of the Industrial Revolution has rendered it virtually opaque. A tin pail with a thin rope attached to a handle says precariously on a ledge. Uh, probably have to get the pail, I'm guessing. This unmarked oak cask has the standard 36 imperial gallon capacity. The bung in the barrel is missing. Uh, so we did this back at the tobacco shop with the boxes. Can I move the barrel? I can move, girl. Ta-da! 
Climbing on top of the barrel, you see this is a standard tin water bucket with type used for swabbing decks. There's a thin rope attached to the handle. Uh, pick up. Pail. I now have a pail. I don't know why, but I do. Oh, wait, I bet you I do not actually. Um, use pail on a water window. You can't do that. Oh, okay. Uh, the Thames. Hold on a second. Let's look around a bit more. I did kind of jump into this. Let me look around. The sparkling River's true condition can be guessed by looking at the refuse strewn along its banks. Uh, that's about accurate. A wood crate. Closer examination reveals that the side of this crate was recently opened and has been nailed tightly shut again. Manifest. She leaps off. Look at the manifest, Holmes. There we go. According to the ship's manifest, the Carthago carried a load of olive oil from Cadiz, but a simple sniff of the offloaded cargo indicates something stronger than olive oil filled these barrels. Um, something that may not be clear from just watching um, is that uh, I have been noticing that sometimes I have to click on things a couple of times. Um, I don't know if that is a limitation of the original software or the fact that I'm using a vir Scum VM is, is a virtual machine. I'm basically functionally emulating this through another piece of software. Actually, two pieces of software because I had to use DOSBox to install this normally, and then I then I'm using Scum VM to emulate through DOSBox. So I don't know if that's causing the issue. The fact that it's, that's the only thing, there's no other slowdown. Um, it's just that occasionally it's not as responsive to clicks as I would like. Sometimes that, it looks like it's sitting here for seconds because it's like I have to actually click it two or three times before it actually works. A 30 foot length of strong, the weathered rope. I bet you I can pick up that rope. Pick up the rope. Pick up the manifest too, see if we can do that. Nope. Okay. Uh, same barrels, ship. This ship is a clipper named Carthago. It appears deserted. Can I open the shed door? I think we came from that way though, didn't we? Oh, maybe not. Aha! A heavy bung hammer used by dock workers to hammer the plugs into the oak barrels. The man who wields a 16 pound tool must be strong and accurate. If he misses the mark, he'll shatter the barrel. The hammer. Anything else in here? Nope. Okay. Um, so, we now have a rope, a pail, a leash. I feel like I might be able to clean the window, but maybe not. I don't see anything that's really going to help with that. Uh, let's look at them, the items we have. Tin water bucket type used for solving decks. Thin rope attached to the handle. 30 piece of rope. Okay, so it's gonna be the same thing. Can I use, I don't think I can combine items. No, I can't, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm trying to think, yeah, the other hand's asking if I could fill the barrel. That's so what I'm thinking. Um, maybe use the barrel on the Thames. Or use the pail on the Thames. Okay, I can, all right. Didn't think this could be that easy. All right, now let's use pail. Oh, I have to pick up the pail again. That's eh, silly. I, no, I can't pick it up anymore. Oh, that's odd. Move pail. Use hammer on pail. Uh, weird, use rope on pail. Oh, that's interesting. I'm no. Move pail. Nope. Pick up pail. Alright. Just check the bottom. Blackwood most certainly entered the warehouse through this door. Draw your revolver, Watson. Let us seize the malefactor straight away. 
I am unarmed, Holmes. You didn't tell us the firearms might be required here. Perhaps under circumstances we should not be so hasty. Quite right, Doctor. I nearly lost my head. Caution is in order. Blackwood is unquestionably vicious and he may be armed. We know he is not alone. As always, Holmes, you have raised the most pertinent issues. So let us learn more for proceeding. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, soap. Uh, so I don't think so. Um, but let's double check here. Uh, that's powder. That's the analysis results. Uh, this was the uh, powder um, that's... Uh, I'll let you look at it. Um, this is the uh, from the, the original body. Um, it smells of camphor. Uh, well, we thought business cards. But I think maybe something else here. Uh, Professor's Best. Liver Elixir. There's Medicine. Beecham's tablets. No, okay. Okay. Um, use leash. Okay, no, that one. So I can't do anything with Toby. Uh, use robot window. Nope. Let's try something silly. Use hammer on window. Do that. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's try moving barrels again. May I have to move the barrel again. Okay, something in the ground here. A rag. <laughs> Calico cloth. Let us pick up the rag. Let us use the rag with the pail. The rag is soaking wet. Let us use the sweat ra wet rag on the window. <laughs> I'll be here a little squeaky. Again, it, it, it's, it's charming. Um, it occasionally has interesting sound effects, but they're so spare, it almost raises the question of why did you choose this moment to add sound effects to? Um, but uh, honestly, it's just enough of it that uh, it, it, it's a neat little detail. Stacked barrels conceal part of the room. A plank has been propped up against the inside of the door to keep it shut. Further into the warehouse, two men are conferring. One of the men is wearing a top hat and matches Blackwood's description. He looks furtively around the warehouse. The other man examines a large pendant. Okay, then. Door still locked. Um, let's talk to Dr. Watson. Now I've looked in. There are two men there, Watson. Neither appears to be armed. A frontal assault seems in order. Agreed? I am prepared to follow you anywhere, Holmes, but we better move quickly now or we'll lose our surprise. A plank is jammed against the inside of the door. I think we could force our way in if we had the right tool to see anything we might use. Shall I sacrifice my shoulder? Very game of you to offer, Watson. Very audacious, but no, that won't work. There must be something around here we can use. Um, uh, uh, sacrifice the shoulder is an interesting choice. Again, really good attention to detail in this game. Um... The reason why Watson is in London and with Holmes uh, is because uh, he was originally a soldier in Afghan, a soldier in Afghanistan. That was actually a comedy as a medic, specifically a surgeon in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, he was invalided out because of an injury. Um, in A Study to Scarlet, the very first story, um, the injury was in fact to his shoulder. Uh, and um, in a later story, which escapes me. Um, he revealed his wound to be his, his leg. Um, and then other ones just kind of vaguely reference his war wound. Um, so the fact that sacrificing his shoulder could actually be a homage to one of the two potential war wounds that Watson has. Um, this is a weirdly huge controversy in the Sherlock Holmes scene um, because it's not just that he has two wounds. Um, the way he references always my war wounds, as in singular, as in not wounds, but my wound. Um, uh, but the fact is, is the wound moves. And so because uh, Sherlockians or Holmesians like to 
make sure everything is written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and by Watson is fact. Uh, they've just spent literally decades trying to reconcile this, when in fact, it's just because Conan Doyle forgot where the wound was. So I find that interesting. Use the hammer on the door. I'll beat this shit down. Watson, the crime is being perpetuated in our very midst. We must apprehend the criminals. I need your assistance. Stand but the ready. Nice bend in the door there. Dun, 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 dun. Music, music, music. Ooh, now you are. Let me see the other side of this attack. People are running, barrels everywhere. Oh my god, jumping after him! Watson almost gets hit by a barrel! Did we, did we get him? Did he run away? It's a little unclear. We're back home! What happens? Where is he? Let's drive the holding Blackwood at Bow Street for the charge of stolen, selling stolen property. While he is interested in how Sarah Carraway's jewelry came into Blackwood's possession, he is not convinced that there are grounds to issue a formal charge of murder yet. The man is a stupid and lazy cur, Watson. I agree. I swear he would drive me to distraction. Does he expect that I should do all of his work for him? Perhaps your criticism of his handling of the Collins bungalow murder still rankles. The assertion that a reasonably intelligent child of six could have solved the case in half an hour did not sit well with him. Perhaps, though it was true, his procedure was so sloppy it almost made me weep. So, Watson, I would see him face to face with Mr. Blackwood in order. What do you say? Leon Holmes, though I suspect Mr. Blackwood may have lost his tongue. Perhaps you could think of a way to make him talk. Um. There's an interesting bit there I want to kind of circle back on. Um, let's go to the uh, last page here. I, I want to... Um, is, perhaps your criticism of his handling of the Collins bungalow murder still rankles. Um, it is a tradition um, in both uh, uh, the original canon and in uh, pastiches to reference cases that are not documented. Um, and that's a nice little example of that, um, where uh, we don't know what that murder was about. Um, it's a reference to an unpublished case. Um, and pastiche writers have sometimes taken those gaps and those vague references and turned them into whole cases themselves. Um, the Giant Ride of Sumatra, for example, is a very popular one, which a number of pastiches have been written because that was one where uh, uh, Watson said, quote, the world is not prepared to know. Um, so lots of people have very different interpretations of that. So the only way kind of carrying on that tradition of referencing another story that we are unfamiliar with. And there's, by the way, there's lots of room for these because there are literally hundreds of cases, according to the canon, that Holmes has been a part of. This is the police court. There's the crowds, cells. Well, there's Blackwood right there. Keys and the guard. This window looks out into an empty courtyard. Isn't that helpful? Holding cells while awaiting an appearance before the magistrate. I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Oh yeah, and pleased I am to make your acquaintance, your worship. But you have to push off. Only official personnel is allowed down here. So let's draw this given permission to speak with your prisoner. No offense to your honor, but I need more than your say-so and sharpish like mind. Otherwise, my superior will have my hide. It is urgent I speak with Inspector, Gre Inspector Gregson immediately. Then hang off the Scotland Yard urgently. I've never seen Gregson in Bow Street for all the 17 years I've worked here. Well, okay then. Then we're going to head back out to Scotland Yard. And you Dan appreciated the action and intensity of our uh, dockside scene. Which again, I mean, for the limitations of work, it was actually not bad. Hey, buddy. Um, uh, yeah, it does look a bit like Fates of Atlantis. Um, uh, they, they were different... Uh, uh, Yodan's referring to uh, Indiana Jones, The Fate of Atlantis. Um, that was a LucasArts game? LucasArts game, yeah, it had to be. Um, so different company, uh, but certainly uh, around, around the same time period uh, of the uh, early 90s. Um, actually, The Fate of Atlantis is a really good game, too. Um, I haven't played it in a number of years, but um, if you like 
this kind of game um, with less mystery but more kind of, of action and intrigue. Um, Fate of Atlantis is actually really good. It has a kind of irritating uh, maze component near the end, I will say, um, but otherwise it's a really strong game. I try to speak one of the prisoners being held at Bow Street Police Court. And Hastings wouldn't let you in. Say no more, Mr. Holmes. That one takes his duties a bit too serious to my way of thinking. I bet he'd pull his cosh on the queen herself if she came in without a pass. Here you are. This should satisfy him. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, again, um, I've talked about this before in previous episodes, but um, older school game, there's a lot of this going back and forth between locations that is done purely to extend gameplay. They're, in a modern game... We wouldn't have had this. I would have just gone right into the police court and talked to the guy. Um, but this is just the style of the design. Um, it makes you feel like you're doing more. It makes you feel like you're more involved in, in the process. Give pass to guard. Very good, Mr. Holmes. You and Mr. Wa Dr. Watson the answer. George Blackwood. I have evidence that will put a rope around your neck before Christmas, Blackwood. Confess. Your reputation for subtlety is undeserved, Mr. Holmes. You can hardly threaten a man who is about to die. Never mind, the threat is bogus in any case. I've only been charged with stolen property. The stolen property charge is a temporary expedient, Mr. Blackwood. Soon you'll be indicted for murder in the first degree. Now here's a friendly word. Once the English judicial system traps a crimi capital criminal in its capital capacious maw, it chews on him like a piece of tough mutton, and after it breaks him down, it unceremoniously spits him out like a repulsive piece of gristle. Would you not wish to spare yourself that aggravation? Mr. Blackwood, your situation is precarious to put mildly. Do you have anything to say to mitigate your crime? Anything that might save you from the hangman? Mr. Holmes, it was an accident, I swear. I didn't mean to kill that girl. I was hired to find the letter that she was supposed to be holding. What was in this letter? Haven't the foggiest. I never found it. I searched her digs in her dressing room and came up empty. So I held her up outside the theater, figuring she had it on her. Blackwood, you murdered the woman. Why, if you merely wanted to rob her? I'm getting to that. She panicked, see, and I got overexcited. I slashed her to make her stop screaming. But it's my training, you understand. I went for the carotid artery. Carot carotid artery. She was dead in seconds. Then I tried to make it look like the ripper done it. Cut her up and took her jewelry. So that's the job wasn't a total loss. What a sordid story. A simple robbery turns into a heinous murder of a young woman. What could be worse? Since you asked, it turns out that Sarah Carraway was the wrong girl. She's a redhead, you see. I was supposed to be looking for a sister, Anna Carraway, who's a blonde. It's Anna who's supposed to have the letter. How'd you discover your error? Party that hired me, old gent, very high tone, if you know what I mean, it became very aggravated when I described Sarah, and after I told him she didn't have the letter, and he was, he said, Sarah, says him, you idiot, it's Miss Anna Carraway, it was the letter. I beg your pardon, says I, but you never told me her Christian name, you just said her name was Carraway, the nerve of some people. I just left him standing there in St. James Park, fuming at the sky. Who was this gentleman? Said so his name was Fitzroy, but I'm certain that's a lie. People lie to me when they need my services. It's a sad commentary on human nature, isn't it? Why did he hire you? I got a tiny reputation among the upper classes. I've done haypenny strong arm stuff, a touch of blackmail, and the odd bit of dealing goods without the benefit of sales receipts. But I'd never killed. Until now. It was an accident, I swear. Swear it on more, Mr. Blackwood. Let the facts tell the tale. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yonan points out that some of the old Sierra games, you could put yourself into a, a no-win condition, and it's true. Um... Uh, and the game would not even notify you that they were in an unplayable state. Uh, uh, this seems to be more designed that you just can't progress until you have all the facts. Um, that being said, um, one of the games I skipped, uh, 1985 Sherlock game, uh, was text adventure, and it is timed. Um, so if you don't do certain things at certain times, then the criminal just escapes. Uh, and you have no idea of knowing what those things are until you play through the case over and over and over again. That was another one where... A, you play the game by playing it through multiple times. And B, it's not very visually interesting. It's just words on a screen. So, uh, I skipped that one. It would seem, Mr. Blackwood, that you've recovered the letter you were hired for after all. What do you mean by that, Mr. Holmes? Anna had given the letter to Sarah for safekeeping. It was hidden in the pendant you took from her the night you murdered her. Now, if you expect any leniency at all, you will reveal the whereabouts of your fence. Ironic, isn't it, Holmes? I do my job and get the rope for it. Well, it won't do me any good where I'm going. Talk to a party named Jameson. He has a pawn shop on the other side of the river, a perfect front for his line of work. He and I have had a few business dealings over the years. He's a clever brute and pretty well connected. Do you have anything more to tell us, Mr. Blackwood? I've coughed up everything I know. I hope you can save me from swinging. 
Truth to tell, Blackwood, I doubt it, but you knew that, didn't you? You feel may feel better with a clear conscience. I unfortunately do not. Um, again, I want to kind of uh, reiterate this because I guess this happened to me a couple episodes ago is where I talked to someone. It looked like it was the end of the conversation, um, but I didn't click on them again and I got stuck because I learned from that. I learned to do it with Blackwood here. And, he's, and you saw three very different conversations in order. And what's probably happening on the back end is that um, I, 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 I get past the guard. I get the first conversation with Blackwood and then the game goes, cool, have you found X clue? If you have, then a new conversation begins. Um, so if I had done this in the quote unquote correct order, I would have found Blackwood, talked to him, gone off, done something else, probably found in a diary, come back, and then had another conversation with him. So from that perspective, the way the game was designed, it would have seemed very natural. He's full bluster, I can't have anything. I go out and I come back with the facts and he actually breaks down. But because I've already solved those, the game's kind of going through a checklist, so we get Blackwood just spontaneously breaking down for no reason. Um, again, it's not bad design, um, it's a little limited, uh, and again, it, it's a combination of adventure designs were designed a certain way, and this is trying to tell a story within that very specific adventure design. So people who were trained to play adventure games a certain way probably would have gotten that much more natural progression, but because I'm playing this from a modern perspective and missing certain details, I'm kind of blocking myself with certain things, and then I'm, I'm now catching up with all the stuff that I have been blocked by because I found this one little knife like a long time ago. I probably, when I found that earlier on in the game, you know, about two hours of gameplay or earlier, I would have had this whole sequence, then gone to Anna's thing, picked up her information, picked up the business cards, blah, 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 and all that. Um, uh, Yuda mentions, I remember Gold Rush, I believe it was. Never could figure out what I did wrong. I always died from dysteria at the same spots, despite multiple attempts at walkthroughs. Yeah, some of those games are really, really hard. And I, I would even argue unplayable. Um, uh, and that's the weird thing about um, playing these older games that I find fascinating. One of the reasons why I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this one, but also I, I've been trying to do more play older games where I can, uh, is that we don't play games the same way anymore. Um, and it, it's one of the things that you don't really think about, but um, this game was designed in a world where walkthroughs didn't exist, right? This game was designed in a world that did not have things like right-click. Uh, so there's obviously uh, interface and UI things that when you, when you play older games, because it's kind of clunky, this is intuitive. It's because intuitive is that we have learned since then how UI is generally found good practices for, and we're able to implement those to the point where, uh, for example, if you ever played a game where you're, it's three dimension perspective and you're walking, almost every game uses WASD on a keyboard to move around. But if you play some older games in the 90s, WASD was not established. So they'll use arrow keys. Some of them will use IJKL. Um, so uh, it, it's not always consistent or obvious. Some will even use a number pad, and not all keyboards have number pads now. Uh, so that's one thing um, it's worth playing these older games is to, um, it's not always possible to put yourself in the mindset of a contemporaneous player um, to be able to think the way they did. Uh, like I said, I mean, we, we live in a world where I bought five games today. Uh, you know? I mean, it's like, it's, last time I played this game, I probably have bought maybe 12 games. And that's just really common now. Um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll buy a couple of Pumble Bundle. I'll, there's some free offerings. I'll download a couple of uh, new games on my phone that are free. The, we have a constant churn of games that we have now, whereas this would have been, this is the game you bought, and this is the game you played for a long time. Um, so I know I keep going on about that, but um, it's definitely worth kind of reiterating that this is not the way we play games now. So let's go to the pawn shop. Uh, it's fine. I don't. I don't think we've been here before. But the layout of this feels very similar to the other merchant we saw last episode. Um, it has the same kind of wall along here, counter here, person. It looks kind of the same. Um, so I think it's probably close. We're getting close to the end of the game. Um, so the artist probably uh, said this is a short scene. There's not a lot going on here. We could probably, if not reuse assets, at least save a little bit of money by by not throwing everything out, using an existing scene and kind of reworking it a bit. That's not uncommon. 
Um, particularly in older games like Nintendo games where you see people that look exactly the same but they're color swapped, palette swapping is the term. Um, that's the same idea, which is like, let's just find ways to, to use our limited resources to maximum benefit. With its worn ebony tuning pegs and artificially aged walnut veneer, this instrument is masquerading as a handcrafted 18th century Italian viola cello. In point of fact, the instrument is produced in Cheapside Factory sometime in the last decade. This is a Thomas A. Edison model, popular in the previous decade. This machine plays only tinfoil records, which have recently been eclipsed by the Berliner Roof Discs. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know when the Edison phonograph game is, because the game is ostensibly set in 1888. Um, was the phonograph as bad as 1878? I don't know. It's interesting. I assume so, because otherwise the details of the game have been good. This large snare drum purports to be a replica of the type used by John Philip Sousa's U.S. Marine Band, which is very popular at the time. A stunning green safety bike manufactured at James Starley Works in Coventry, smartly equipped with the revolutionary Dunlop pneumatic tires, it promises to make all kinds of philosophies obsolete. Dunlop tires were actually a uh, point of a clue in the adventure of Silver Blaze. Um, bicycles were very, very, very popular and big in the Victorian era. They were seen as kind of a way, a, a new vehicle to kind of increase independence, particularly for a young unmarried woman. So bicycles were huge at the time. A charming paper mache figure fitted with a painted china head. The doll wears a traditional cap of a Dutch dairy maid. A small oil lamp suitable for reading in the nightlight. Or nightlight. Its base is made of Delft china in a typical blue and white foil pattern. The shop's glass-covered display counter holds coins, rings, pendants, bracelets, freestanding gems, and other easily concealable portable items. Uh, okay, and the owner, Nigel Jameson. Or Jamison, I think it'd be Irish. I have good reason to believe that you have recently come into the illegal possession of an oval-shaped ivory pendant and a heavy gold chain. You may have reason to believe, sir, but do you have evidence? Indeed I do. I saw you at the Surrey Commercial Docks receiving dependent from George Blackwood. I doubt that. If you have the business to conduct, don't let me detain you. I'd like to buy a few items and perhaps some information. All items are prices marked, though prices are negotiable. Information will certainly carry a slightly higher price tag unless you simply require directions. Uh, so let's try... Um okay, I do indeed. George Blackwood himself gave you your name from his cozy cell in Bow Street. If you believe the word of an incarcerated criminal, sir, you are a fool. Good day. Okay. Let's uh, keep trying to push him. I do not believe that I would have much difficulty in convincing the police that you were an accessory after the fact to the murder of the young woman whose pendant you received. Murder? Now let's not be hasty. I recall a pendant. I don't know what was stolen. Uh, I'm a man of business. I rely on the good faith of my... Say it for Inspector Westrod, Mr. Jameson. Where is the pendant? I sold it almost right after I got hold of it to a private inquiry agent named Moorhead. He knows me, knows I deal with a certain class of goods if you take my meaning. He keeps an office in the city. You will find him there, I suppose. That's all I know of him. Has anyone else approached you about the pendant? I remind you to be frank with me. Now that you have mentioned it, yes. Shortly after I sold the pendant to Moorhead, one of my regular clients came in looking for a pendant. Though he used different means than you, he persuaded me to tell him who I sold it. Who is his so-called client's name? Hunt. Robert Hunt. What do you know about him? As little as possible, if you take my meaning. He's done my business as quote unquote rough trade. Which to me has a very different meaning now. Okay. Um, you and I was arguing a certain way. An advantage of that was to create a stronger bond with the game. It was one single game you had. When a game stood out, it really stood out. I must have played uh, Gabriel Knight two over ten times. I loved the bits. Nowadays, I finish the game, move on to the next. If I absolutely loved Horizon Zero Dawn, I doubt I'll play it again. And it's it's funny you mention that um, because I had the exact same experience with uh, Gabriel Knight one. Um, uh, I played the hell out of that. And sadly, I played the hell out of it. But um, the copy I had. Uh, the last disc, because the multi-disc uh, setup um, ha had a, an error, it was a bug, um, so I could not actually finish the game for decades. Uh, so I loved it, but I never actually saw the ending. Um, and then, so I move on, like, like you said, now, that was my one game, I eventually move on, played other games. I had the same experience with Hitchhiker's uh, Head to the Galaxy, but in fact I played it, but I just got stuck on that one. Um, 
And then, like, about four or five years ago, I picked up a copy on uh, Steam or Good Old Games, uh, and I actually played it. And it's like, oh, I don't remember any of this stuff because I had never gotten to the ending. But in my head, I assumed I must have seen the ending because I played it so much. I had forgotten about that bug until I got to that section. I said, that's right, I can never pass this part. Um, but that's been patched and not going to be able to get through. Uh, but you're right, yeah, it, it, it was very much this was the game you played. Uh, and, and, and you would have maybe four or five games, six games. Um, I also played Bard's Tale a lot. Uh, Bard's Tale was, was a big game. I, I never got anywhere into it because it was just so complicated. Um, but uh, I remember having it uh, and, and talking to people about it and, and sharing information. Uh, also, even uh, this is also the era of Nintendo games. And again, it was like you would get your cartridge. You have like four or five carts maybe you played. Um... Yeah, actually, I want to play the um, 20th anniversary edition of uh, Gabriel Knight 1 at some point. Although it's hard because I'm so used to uh, Tim Curry's voice acting. Uh, anyway, we're now to the Moorhead Moore Detective Agency. A framed photo taken from the Aberdeen Illustrated Gazette. The picture shows a stern-faced provincial constable and carries a caption, Officer Gardner foils burglary attempt. The man is of middle, middle years and otherwise undistinguished appearance. Um, another thing I want to talk about a little bit uh, is um, this game has a lot of, of what is nowadays called environmental storytelling. Um, because it's a 1982 game, um, a lot of the environment storytelling is, is, is literal. Um, you click on the thing, you get a description of it. Um, in later games, um, moving through the space tells you a story. Um, specifically, um, I, I, I'm often refer of, um, uh, Portal, Portal 1. Uh, you see references to the cake is a lie on graffiti in various parts of the game um even though gladys keeps telling you about cake um and spoiler for a 10 year old game the cake is in fact a lie um but that's the kind of environmental storytelling that that uh, happens um in uh this game this you start to see a nascent attempts to that because like we're learning about um these characters by clicking on things and reading the descriptions uh, some of it is required, and of course, because it's a metric game, I'm not sure which things are going on are important, which ones aren't. But as a result of going through all that, I'm also learning about the space and the people who inhabit that space. Uh, and because we're now at a decent graphical point in the video game evolution, um, also just little textures like uh, the way the lamps are used and the colors and the rugs are also telling us a bit of a story. Like, you know, the fact in this case it's a detective agency, um, they are. Uh, Affluent enough that they have a receptionist, and specifically a busy receptionist. Um, and we saw that um, one of the people involved in the detective agency is, in fact, a former constable. So we've learned a lot already about these two characters, even though we've never seen them and only had, before we walked in, just a name. The fact they were detectives, we didn't know until they appeared on the map, until we saw more head detective agency. So again, little things that are designed to economically give you information without just flat out telling you everything even though this is a game which is a lot of clicking on things and telling you this is a game this is a game that's by design having to tell more than show but from a technological standpoint it is showing more than it could before and it's trying to take advantage of that Philo Remington's name is written across the top of this old typewriting machine, presumably as once a useful office tool, but now many of his keys are broken and there is no ink ribbon and evidence, there is no more than a very heavy paperweight. Perhaps it possesses sentimental value. Cluttered with secretary paraphernalia, this desk supports writing pads, sheets of paper, ink blotter, letter opener, paper clips, nail file, cheap novels, and a selection of teacups. Everything is piled precariously enough to court disaster and invites the impression that very little work gets done here. So maybe she's not as busy as it looks. Pneumatic tube. That's some steampunk shit. The tube appears to penetrate the wall of the room behind the door. If it works properly, the tube serves as a convenient means of communication between offices and reduces the risk of strained vocal cords. A conventional portrait of Queen Victoria enthroned and costumed in her imperial regalia. Such a picture is often thought to lend an aura of solidity and respectability to an otherwise tawdry commercial enterprise. Let's talk to the receptionist. 
My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. We wish to speak with one of the principals, preferably Mr. Moorhead. I am Violet Granger, confidential assistant to the gentleman. Let me see if Mr. Moorhead is available. Mr. Moorhead, there's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes here to see you. Mr. Moorhead, hello. He must have stepped out while I was on my tea break. Ah, yes, here's a note. Back in an hour or two, HM. You can leave your card if you like. May I speak to Mr. Gardner, then? No, Mr. Gardner hasn't been in today, which is most aggravating if you'd like to know. Why are you perturbed with Mr. Gardner, if I may ask? Because I'm wrestling with God's curiosity, that's why. A client, who must remain nameless, you understand, summoned him to a midnight rendezvous at the zoo in Regent's Park. I saw a telegram. There was some nonsense about bringing her jewelry, but I knew what she was about, and so did Mr. Gardner. He left here with a smile on his face. Mr. Moorhead and I quite a laugh about it. Mr. Gardner's a bachelor, you know. He has... Was that client Miss Anna Caroline? However, did you know that? So, Regent's Park. Miss Granger, we are assisting the police in the investigation of a criminal matter. May we examine Mr. Moorhead's office? Certainly not. Even if I could give you my permission, you couldn't get in. Mr. Moorhead always locks the door when he leaves, and he says you can't break in that office with a hammer. Well, I do have a hammer. Um, so, uh, another interesting point. Uh, as she mentions, her name is Violet Granger. There are no less than four women in the Sherlock Holmes canon with the first name of Violet. Do you really like the name Violet? For some reason. So again, nice little touch. Give her a card. Please make sure Mr. Moorhead receives this. It's imperative we speak to him as soon as possible. I'll make sure he contacts you as early as convenient. Yeah, it's locked. Okay. A heavy oak door with a secure lock probably leads to the agency's inner office. The names Moorhead and Gardner are stenciled on the glass portion of the door. Glass is opaque at at least one half an inch thick, making it quite a formidable door. I'm gonna do something here. Save the game. And I'm gonna see what happens. They use the hammer on the door. <laughs> you can't do that. Ah! I figured as much. Worth a try. All right, let's see if we can go to Regent's Park. Um, oh, you saw a Let's Play of, of GK 20th and did Dutch to the original. Okay, cool. Um, let's not probably uh, play at some point. Um, I think it's also one of those remasters you can switch back and forth between two. Um, but I have both. So, I mean, uh, I'll probably play the, just the 20th version one. Also, it has apparently some, some uh, changes in the original game, which I like. Constable Duggan. I think he was the same constable at the murder scene. Good morning, Constable. I've never known one of Inspector Gregson's men to draw a zoo duty. Ah, it's you, Mr. Holmes. There's been a spot of trouble here, but we have it well on hand. We're limiting access to the zoo until we complete our investigation. What well, has happened? Well, confidential, like a man has been killed under mysterious circumstances, if you take my meaning. Indeed I do. Perhaps Inspector Gregson can use some assistance. I'm sure he could, Mr. Holmes, though he's not likely to admit it. He's in a foul mood today, sir. Watch your step, won't you? You'll find him blustering behind the elephant's cage. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, go right in. Alright, there's the elephant cage. To the zoo administrative offices. The elephant is a female Indian pachyderm. She appears well cared for, healthy, and as happy as a caged animal can be. Uh, probably not as happy as you actually think. Um, some of the Victorian zoos were not great by modern standards. Oh. That was weird. Ah, Mr. Holmes, come and put your tuppence in. Have you very public spirits, I'm sure. You might as well have a look at this then. I know you won't leave until you do. Um, yeah, that was weird because I clicked on the plaque and then it walked off the screen into this scene, which is fine. I don't need to see the plaque. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. Huh? You know how these games are. <laughs> and the Watson just appears. That's what I was trying to do. The elephant's... Elephant is named Chloe. Uh, that was the end of the typo. Now getting near the end of the game, so we're going to see more, more and more of this. I'll get that in a second. Uh, she is 32 years old and has re resided in Regent's Park Zoo since she was an adolescent. 
Um, so, uh, game production. Um, the first parts of the game are usually extremely well polished. Uh, modern games uh, that's usually either a demo, sometimes it's an E3 uh, demo, um, sometimes it's used to for, for promotional videos, what have you. So those first few hours are usually pretty well done. Um, as a game gets towards completion, um, you sometimes find errors and bugs and go back and polish earlier parts of the game, but when you get closer to the end, once the game is done, you don't do that anymore because the game is done. Um, and particularly in this time period, um, once the game was was done and printed on discs, that was it. You know, we didn't have post day one patches, uh, so you're gonna find typos and errors and bugs like this a little more prevalently near the end of older games because there's just no reason to go back and fix them. All right, now we're back here, and Watson will walk on this time and slowly make his way over here. There are several wounds slashed through the lapels of his jacket. A good deal of tearing is evident. These tears appear in a pattern reminiscent of large claw marks. Totally, totally a line. The body of a middle-aged man lies in characteristic pose of death. The head is turned to the side and one knee is slightly drawn up. His black hair is matted by dried blood where his skull has been severely crushed. His clothes are very dirty, though they are of decent quality. The left trouser leg is ripped and frayed, exposing some deep lacerations and punctures. Oddly, there is very little blood surrounding any of the victim's wounds. When his head is now misshapen, Detective Frederick Gardner is clearly recognizable from his photograph at the Moorhead and Gardner Agency. The leg seems to have been broken by a fall rather than by any human assault. Let's see if there's any other response. I'm saying else, I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to look at this real quick. It's like, here's the broken leg. I'm going to move just slightly up. It's now corpse and moves slightly over. And slash wounds. I mean, like, there's a lot of detail in this extremely small space. We saw that again at the very beginning. But even more so because now, because the way this screen is framed, Holmes has to actually stand in front of the corpse. So, I mean, I have even less room to get those details. Um... But yeah, we have this hat over here that does not seem to be of interest. So it's an interesting, weird little blocking moment. I'll look at it. Dr. Riggs. Good morning, Inspector. What do we have here? Deceased John Doe, stiff as the proverbial upper lip. Dead eight hours at least from a crushing blow to the head. His pockets have been emptied. Robbery, I imagine. Where was he killed, Inspector? And why have you moved the body? Ah, Mr. Holmes, you always proceed immediately to the crux of the matter. I just told the lad this body's been moved, but how did you know? Given his head wound, there ought to be more blood in the ground where he fell. What? Oh, yes, exactly my thought. He was certainly not done in here, then. Correct. And it was somewhere damp and dirty, and he was moved by a small person. Oh, yeah? Next you tell me what he had for his last tea. Given time, perhaps, I can tell you now that he was an inquiry agent by profession, a dark-eyed, left-handed bachelor, an ex-policeman, and a very foolish fellow. He was murdered by a hired killer. Mr. Holmes, you exhaust my goodwill and try my patience when you talk like that. You surely do. Do I look like an idiot? You don't know all these things. You can't. You're just trying to show me up. Perhaps you had better move along. Remember, infer interference in police matters is a criminal offense. You lately said that you never received interesting cases, Gregson. I'm sure even you can see it's plus a remark was at best premature. Too much pride is not a good thing, Inspector. Good day. Good day. What can you tell me about how he was killed? I'm sure you'll have opinions of your own about that. You usually do. <laughs> have you discovered anything else, Inspector? Nothing I, I can tell an amateur. Gregson's bitchy today. All right, fine. Don't talk to you anyway. Constable, have you noticed anything that might help Inspector Gregson see this case more clearly? I ain't saying nothing interesting except that elephant when I came in here. Somehow that response does not surprise me. This highly polished brass sign reads London Zoological Gardens, Peter Hollington, Head Keeper. Let's go inside and talk to Peter Hollington. I'm sure he's saw something. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, first you can wait me and look, look at all your shit. The open drawer here contains the files from M to O they have been shuffled through recently.
The Swiss, so proper and exacting in the manufacture of precision timepieces, built some uncommonly unattractive cuckoo clocks. This is one of them. This expensive pair of powerful magnifying binoculars is the type favored by ardent bird watchers, ship captains, and spies. This stuffed snow white wandering albatross has a wingspan of over 8 feet. The beast who supplied this skin must have been one of the largest and most beautiful specimens ever to prowl the jungles of Bengal. Even though it's white and black, and not yellow and black. I'm guessing this is an, an artist in miscommunication. I saw a hotspot somewhere. Oh, it's a door. Okay. Long time. Mr. Hollingston, uh, Mr. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Would you please tell us who found the body? I almost tripped over it when I came to work this morning. Talk about starting the day in the wrong foot. When were the animal cages cleaned up? About 6 p.m. when the animals were being fed. Why do you ask? Could anyone on your staff have seen the murdered man? As I told the inspector, everyone except Simon Kingsley leaves the premises at 7 p.m. Simon doesn't have much to do with people, but he has unusual rapport with all the animals. Felix the lion is a special friend. Passing strange, if you ask me, but there it is, to each his own. Since Simon didn't sound the alarm, I assume he saw nothing. May we have Mr. Kingsley's address? There are one or two points I'd like to clear up for me. Of course, he lives alone in the flat in St. John's Wood. The address is 241 Groves Edge Road, just opposite Lord's. I should say the Inspector Gregson seemed quite uninterested in Simon. Somehow, that doesn't surprise me. Is there anything else you can tell us concerning this regrettable incident, Mr. Hollingston? No, I'm afraid you've exhausted my meager store of information. Okay, nothing there. So we have yet another location to go to. I'm kind of surprised. Um, uh, 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 well, I mean, I suppose I'm not surprised. This, is, this was a, a EA, um, even at this time, was still a pretty big company in terms of the size of their teams. Um, uh, but I mean, still we have a lot of locations here, and some of these locations, like this one, has multiple screens. Um, so there's probably easily two dozen locations here, and we just keep seeing more and more and more of them. I'm excited. I like to see more locations, but it's just interesting that we have done so. So he doesn't know shit. That just, just goes away. Uh, I don't want that. No, I want to go this way. I want to move out that way. Let's see if there's any more on the side of the screen. Can I go out that way? I cannot. Okay. It just looked like an exit. Never mind. Um, again, uh, I'm I only pick occasional details, but like, if you have a road here, it should go somewhere. Um, or there should be a sign or something. Because otherwise it looks like it's just an error. Like, I bet you just... Yeah, yeah, okay. So, that's just four screens for the zoo. That's just quite a lot. Uh, this is, but yeah, I mean, look at the screen right now. This is just a section of it. Look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then six more down here, five more here, six more there. Just a ton of locations. Well, luckily, it's pretty good about putting next location in visual range of the last one. So it's pretty easy to go. Oh, that's new. Click on that. Hello, gentlemen. What may I do for you? We'd like to ask you a few questions regarding the murder that happened at the zoo last night while you're on duty. Please come in and make yourself comfortable. I will. Let me take all of your shit. Oh, no, we're going to move around first. Okay. Uh, do -do -do. I'm. Everyone sits down. I'm going to stand imperiously. There's almost no hotspots in here. It's just the guy. All right. Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Kingsley, a man who was savagely murdered at the zoo last night. Did you observe anything unusual during your tour of the grounds? A murder? During my watch? You don't say. A man named Gardner was found outside the managing director's office, but he was not killed there. Where, then? We were hoping you could tell us. No, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about it. You have a reputation for knowing a lot about animals. Could any of them have been responsible for Mr. Gardner's death? Never, unless they were provoked. No, never. 
Really? Is, it, is this all we've got here? I probably have to present evidence to him. Remarkably tidy and pleasant room, what you say, Doctor? I would indeed, Holmes. It might serve as inspiration for a less fastidious lodger of my acquaintance. <laughs> You're a slob, Holmes. Um, yeah, none of this. I don't know what to do. It just seems like it's a whole lot for nothing. Let me just check the check the old clue book here. That's Anna Carraway's house. Lord Bramwell's mansion, the Rawls mansion, Rawls mansion, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what that is yet. It's Covent Gardens, Flower Cellar, Moongate Pub. As something else, you know, um, uh, this is in presumed order that we've gone through, and uh, we're just now starting to get to the stuff that. Bow Street Floors Courts. Jameson's buying and selling, reception. Zoo Lion's Cage. Zookeeper's Office, Zookeeper's Office. Next flat. Huh, okay. So now I have to look, that's weird. I, before I click, I didn't see anything to click on. Okay, now. All right, I guess I, I guess I just skipped right over the boots. Weird, all right. A well-worn pair of Marks and Spencer Brogan, size 9. The edge of the soles and part of the uppers were encrusted with mud. Several coarse, reddish brown hairs are stuck in the mud. Okay, so I don't think I'd be a little more careful this time. I'm used to kind of just skimming over and catching everything, but it looks like maybe it's the only, the only thing. Commemorative plates. A match of plates commemorating the publication of J.J. Otterburn's monumental... Viviporous Quadrupeds of North America in 1854. Wow. A photograph of Felix, the famous lion of Regent's Park Zoological Gardens. The photograph has been professionally tinted to replicate the beast's natural coloring. The co artist possessed less than modest skills. There's a lot more here than I thought. An outstanding private collection of reference works and monograms of natural history and zoology. There are no novels, no magazines, no nonfiction works with human subjects. Um, yeah, okay, now I think I'll see if we unlocked anything here. There we go. When did you last clean Felix's cage? Last night about 6 or 6.30. You care for several specimens of animals, Mr. Kingsley. Surely you have a favorite. It's no secret that I have a special relationship with Felix. That's no crime. And you would try to protect him if you thought he was in trouble. I would try. Mm-hmm. What if I were to tell you that I have seen enough to assure me that Felix was not responsible for Gardner's death? He wasn't? I mean, of course he wasn't. But let's be frank, Mr. Kingsley. You moved Gardner's body from Felix's cage, did you not? What happened? I assure you, I bear you no ill will, nor Felix either, for that matter. I would keep your story just between us. Please remember that another person's safety may depend on your veracity. I thought I had been very clever. Now I know better. Here's what happened, I swear. I hear Felix making a commotion about 10 o'clock, and I went to call him. I found him gnawing a dead man's leg. This gardener fellow had fallen or jumped into his cage, and Felix had killed him. Lions are very territorial, you know. I dragged the corpse out of the pits and put him outside the MD's office. I just couldn't carry him any further. Then I cleaned Felix's pit the best I could in the dark. Didn't want Felix to get put down for something that really wasn't his fault. Gardner's either drunk or he committed suicide. Actually, he was neither, Mr. Kingsley. He was, as I said, murdered. And his murderer wanted to make it look like Felix was the perpetrator. How insidious. People really are disgusting. Preach. Big mood. Is there anything else you can tell us, Simon? No, I think I've told it all. I'm so happy Felix won't be blamed. Let me in the cage. I want to go look in the cage. Uh... Okay, maybe we can go look in the cage. I'm not sure how. I may have to go back to talk to the owner and ask for permission to look in the cage. That seems like a logical connection. Anyhow, back to the Zoological Gardens. I bet you've ever been to the Zoological Gardens. I should probably go next time in London. I should probably do a walking tour of homes, too. Um, I've been to... Uh, to you want to be back in the museum, but I haven't actually done like an actual like walking tour of your like home stuff. 
Probably because my family would kill me if I did that. Let's see if Gregsy wants to talk to us. I bet she doesn't. I bet she's a jerk. Oh, no. Go for Watson. There you go. Nope. Gregson's still a jerk. Door it is. Hollingston. Sorry, the uh, PDF is right next to uh, um, right next to the window here. So sometimes when I click around here on the edge, I actually click on the PDF. Um, I haven't seen a cage anywhere. No, I, I thought uh, for a second I thought it was over there, but otherwise that was the um, elephant cage, the lion cage, and I still can't go this way. All right, let me try something else. I don't know why I confused an elephant for a lion, but that is where we're at at this stage of things. To the main gates. To the lion cages! Okay, so it looks like... Mm, um, when, when, when it comes to the screen, it looks like you're walking from here, but it turns out you're walking from there. So I, had no, I didn't even think to walk off the left, because I thought that's where I left. Mm. But at least there are signs. At least there are signs. Lion's cage. Shiny object. A small shiny object reflects in the morning sunlight. It appears to be partially covered by mud. It is not possible for me to identify the object or to even speculate as to its actual size. Felix, the famous lion of Regent's Park. Growling. Wow. Captures an infant in British East Africa. He has lived his entire adult life in London. His prolific offspring populate the zoos of Western Europe and the United States. The lion enjoys a small variety of terrain in his captive world. Since the heavy clay of its pit in the cage shows no footprints, food, or even body wastes, either he never ventures down there or the area has been very recently cleaned and raked. Water in the pit is collected rainwater. It's murky and odd bits of debris float in it. Yikes. Yeah! You old big boy. Alright. So that's why. I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna walk off. Go back in. Look at this. Look at this shit. Look at this shit. See? I have no clue what direction you're coming from. Ah. Uh, every other time you have no problem showing the bloody walking animation. Anyway. <clears throat> Again, super minor nitpicks. And there were signs there. The signs were there clearly to help with that exact problem. Hi, Simon. We'll take a few more moments of your time, if you don't mind. Not at all. Please come in. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, see? That walking animation. No problem, boarding in. The zookeeper. I don't want to look at him. I want to talk to him. Simon, I need to examine something in Felix's cage. Would it be possible for you to occupy Felix so that he may go down in the pit? Of course, if you think it's important. It may be a matter of a young woman's life or death. I'll get dressed and meet you at Felix's cage. Fine, we'll return there immediately. Thank you. We get to go back. Yay. Oh yeah. Oh, oh. get up, Watson. Da 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 da. Do 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 do. And he's magically going to be there for Holmes. Yep, you're damn right. 
It's like, we left immediately, we took a cab, we went straight there, and yet somehow, somehow, he's already here! Ugh. Yeah. So how do I get him? Simon holds Felix, who appears to be calm and such strain against the confinement. It's obvious that Kingsley has spent much time with the lion. Oh, okay, you know what? Actually, there's a rope. Use rope. Can you do that? Okay. But I just climb over there and go down. Do you see a glittering object, Watson? What do you suppose it is? A piece of quartzite? Or some foil? Even if it's gold sovereign, Holmes the lion is welcome to it. Do you see anything to help our investigation, Watson? Not the moment, Holmes. Blah 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 blah. Alright. Um. A hook of some kinds. Use wire hook on oh, shiny object. No. Super exciting! Getting objects on the mud. Okay. Let's see if there's another hot spot here. Seriously, there's a ladder right there. It looks like you should just be able to get in there. Pick up shiny object. There we go. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. Inventory. Oops. Right, look. A gold plated watch attached to a fine gold chain. The latch is encrusted with mud and there's a small dent in the bottom edge, otherwise it's in good condition. Open the watch reveals an inscription. A piece of paper is attached to the inside of the lid just below the inscription. You remove the piece of paper for closer inspection. I, I, I do. The watch is well maintained as being keeping perfect time. The inner lid bears the inscription F Gardener, 25 years of loyal service. Piece of paper with number 11, 1786, neatly printed in a bold masculine hand. That's a birth date, I'm almost positive. Uh, can we talk to. No, oh, okay. Well, thanks, but I'm not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna leave. Because I'm a jerk, because I'm Sherlock Holmes. You and your magic teleporting. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the detective agency. Let uh, Mr. Martin know his partner is dead. It's imperative to see Mr. Moorhead, Miss Granger. I'm sorry you just missed him, Mr. Holmes. He was very upset when he left. Do you know where he's gone? No, Boyd delivered a message which Mr. Moorhead read privately. Then he asked me to shut the office door on my way out, which usually means he's opening the safe. A minute later, he left that saying word. Do you have a key for the office door? No, Mr. Moorhead and Mr. Granger have the only keys. Gardner has the only keys as far as I know. Perhaps we could get it from Gardner's body at the zoo. Inspector Gregson must still be there. Watson. I'm sorry to inform you like this, Mr. Granger. Mr. Gardner was found dead at the zoo. In any case, Watson, there were no personal effects found with the body. Oh, that's dreadful. Who could have done such a thing? Sure, I can use the hammer under. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. All right. Let's go back to, Gre to Gregson. Moving around, these little spots. Doug, and you're just doing a great job, let me tell you. Oh, come on. Just 
Pick up corpse. Let's see, just here. Nope, didn't work. Move corpse. Nope. Um. Let's see if anything. Yeah, worth really shot. Uh, let's see if there's anything back in the cage. Wow. Everyone's gone. Pixel hunting. Okay. Let's transition back to here. Um. Oh, okay. I have to roll the typewriter through the office window. That's obvious. Wow. Okay. While I have often argued that Holmes is far more action-oriented than he is traditionally perceived to be in post-canonical interpretations... Throwing a typewriter through a door is not a common thing he does. That's... that's... that's a lot. <laughs> You're such a complete asshole, Holmes. Wow! Alright. Nice office. In fact, look around. Nope, Holmes could do some shit. I'm not doing any of this, by the way. He's just walking around. Here is Watson, a sinister message. Indeed, listen, Watson. Be on platform number two at the St. Pancreas station in ten minutes if you want to see your partner or your client again. Bring the pendant. Come alone. I'll be watching you. This is not a moment to lose, Watson. St. Pancreas will be deserted this time of day. That's definitely a... Place Ooh. You'll never find it, never. Speech. What? Will you risk the lives of two others as well as your own for a cheap pendant? You're a bigger fool than I thought. You're right, I am a fool. You have come here alone and unarmed. You are a fiend hunt. My guess is that Frederick and Miss Calloway have already met their maker. Oh! Oh! Action scene! You can join them! <gasps> oh! Oh, that dude is dead. That dude is totally dead. He's gonna run over by a train. Ah, the famous Scotland Yard jacking off. Pretend copper. You're less than a boil on my backside to my way of thinking. We shall see, Mr. Hunt. We shall see. Where, incidentally, is Miss Calloway? Never. If she is alive and you tell us where she can be found, the law may go easy on her. Hold the other one up. The law's got nothing on me. Dr. Watson and I witnessed your execution of ex-constable Moore. Nonsense. That lunatic attacked me. And in the struggle, he fell under the train. Scotland Yard, I'm sure, will have a different interpretation of the events. Let him. It's your word against mine. Besides, I'll make it my personal business to connect you with the disappearance and murders of Anna Calloway and Frederick Gardner. Don't make promises that can't keep, you silly son. Gardner got eaten by lions, is what I heard. You'll never place me at the scene as the yard boys say. Now, since you're not a real copper and a bit of a dim bulb in the bargain, I'll learn you one more thing. You'll never find a Calloway woman alive. And without her, you have no evidence. So, Mr. So-called Detective, I might become better acquainted with the old Bailey, but you'll tie nothing on me that will hold fast. Dartmoor Prison will never see my face again. Quite right. We will hang at Newgate, if I know anything of British justice. As you I'll make you pay for sticking your nose in my affairs. I will have my revenge. That's a promise. So many have said so, yet here I stand. 
You're going to the Bow Street Police Court. Mr. Hunt, I hope you're not too particular about your accommodations. Where do you live, by the way? Stuff it. Miss by Miss Carraway Watson and hope that she is still alive. Of course, Holmes, but how best to proceed? Perhaps visit Bow Street and chat with our Mr. Hunt. Remember, too, that Moore, Moorhead Secretary spoke of a safe in his office. If he ever had the pendant in his possession, it's likely that's where he will find it now. Drawing to usual, Holmes. Shall we go? So, a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, that was surprisingly cool. I didn't expect that at all, to have a little voiced moment there. Um, but that was functionally a cutscene, and probably a very early example of a cutscene. Um, so that's really exciting, actually. It was voiced over, there was action there. Action, in quotes, but I mean, you know, like, you know, conveniently time train. Um, uh, you know, the guy got killed off screen. The guy got killed. Um, and the other thing that's really cool at the moment is um, the game did a special thing. You know, to kind of reward us for getting so far in the adventure. We get to confront the villain and have a nice little talk. Um, and now it has given us something that has been sadly lacking for a lot of this game, which is clear directions on what to do next. We have two possible options. Um, we can go back to the office, which is where I'm going to go, and then we have to go to Bow Street. So let's uh, in to take his damn time to get to the door. Walk off. Uh, it's over here, right? <clears throat> hey, sorry about your office. We're gonna go right back in there. So just so you know. Um, but again, I mean, uh, uh, I want to talk about it again. Like, you know, the time we threw that hyper to the door, which is still an amazingly obtuse puzzle. Um, the whole thing was kind of choreographed. Uh, and while it was weird that for the first time I was in looking at my room, this now I would go back here and look. And now it makes, in retrospect, a bit more sense. It was the, oh my god, we have to hurry. We have to go stop him because we only have a few minutes. Um, the urgency was not as clear because other parts of the game I've been able to go for as long as I wanted to until a time event happened. And that time suddenly it was urgent. Um, but that's not uncommon for games even today where there's a mismatch between the narrative and the game design. Um, but that moment, again, was a cool little cutscene-ish thing going on there. So, so it, was, it was worth the digression there. But let's, look, let's look around and go back to our usual thing. These large volumes are illustrated case studies of famous European crimes and criminals throughout history. Other titles are related to the business of being a private detective. <laughs> you know, this is break window, leave running, come back and nothing happened, lady says nothing. <laughs> Welcome to Adventure Games. All of the books, pamphlets, and monograms on this shelf are dedicated to the new science of criminology, titles concerning forensic medicine, the study of blood, and discussions of Br Brittion's system of fingerprint analysis dominate the shelf. Um... I hate to break it to you, there was not this many books of criminology in 1888. There were some, not this much. Tiles on the left are devoted to staples of inquiry agents trade, domestic disputes, laws of divorcements, train schedules, and the new photographic techniques. The right side of the shelf, unexpectedly, contain nothing but fiction. The fiction titles are not of the highest quality. Uh, I bet you Varney the Vampire was on those shelves. An easy chair comfort in blue corduroy cloth. It's worn and compressed cushions suggest it served as a daybed from time to time. The oakwood cabinets appear to hold client files. They are not contrary to custom, but arranged in alphabetical order. Presumably the agents or their assistants have some personal method of organizing information, or there might not be any system of organization at all. Do -do -do -do. A large desk. The agent's desk is a large functional pine surface with mahogany veneer. It is covered with papers, advertising flyers, and account books from the 1870s. The drawer of the desk is touched tightly. Shut tightly. Touch tightly. The 
The drawer contains some writing paper, an almost empty bottle of scotch, and a hot water bottle. So one thing that's kind of interesting here is um, uh, private detectives were around uh, in Holmes' times. Um, there's he his claim to being a consulting detective, being unique, but was actually typical. The idea of someone who actually consults with other detectives. Um, and there's one throwaway line about him being not being a detective, neither police nor private. So private detectives were a thing. Um, that said, this is interesting because it's clearly drawing uh, inspirations from the much later uh, American detective fiction in the 20s and 30s, what we now call noir, incorrectly. Um, you know, there's a secretary out there, there's two people, um, two men in the detective agency, uh, there's uh, scotch there, they probably sleep in there. Um, I don't know much about private detectives, uh, but most of them were ex-police officers, but that part is so far true. Um, but also, generally, they had a bit of money. Um, they're not the, the rundown detectives that we see more commonly in that kind of early 20th century detective fiction era. The floor covering extends from wall to wall and appears to be tacked down. It is made from twisted wool and a variety of pleasing colors are woven into its conventional worsted pattern. It appears to be uniformly worn. A broken typewriter. The typewriter used to gain entrance to the office now has more than a few broken keys. <laughs> I wonder who did that. Oh, that guy was a jerk. So where is this safe? I'm not seeing a safe. Donde esta safe? Oh yeah, that's a good point. You know what I'm saying? I wonder if this, I wonder if we could tell her that her other boss is now dead. <laughs> Sorry lady, you don't have a job anymore. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Miss Granger, I'm afraid I have more bad news for you. Mr. Moorhead has been killed. I need to get to his safe. Can you help me? <laughs> Both of them dead? How tragic. Watson, do you have anything you might calm her? She'll be better in a few minutes. Perhaps we should look in the safe while she recovers for herself. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. I'm trying to think of opening them in these. No. Okay. Gotta be in here. Uh, let me try opening the file and cabinets that help. Cannot be opened. It's a filing cabinet! Mm -hmm. Open comfort chair? No. Yeah, I'm trying to look around, see if there's a Large books. Large books, 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 coffee chair. Miss Granger believes there's a safe in this room, Watson. I'm sure she is right. But she's never seen it at home, so I suppose it's possible that what Texas referred to as a safe may not be a safe at all. That's interesting. Let's look in the upper drawer again. No. Yeah, a hollow book is something too. An efficient office is not Watson, though the decorations are a bit too astir for my taste. Indeed, not nearly so comfortably appointed as our own rooms. Seventeen eighty-six. It really feels like a date or a combination or both. 
but oh you know what I thought of something use paper on filing cabinet nah broke shot See if she's recovered. If not, then I'm in the radio. Do you know where the safe is? No, they never let me see it. I heard them say, put it in the safe a hundred times, but in three years here, I've never found out where it was. Yeah, I'll put you up. The other thing is that this, this chair is blocking a chunk of the bookcase. Aha! Writing a paper reads only IOU 12 4 silver 2 pounds HM. 4 S2D. I don't, I don't remember old uh, uh, currency, I'll be honest. Um, I believe it's 4 shillings 2 pennies, but I don't remember what the D stands for. It's been a minute. These picture books aren't books at all, but are a false front. Like, oh, okay, I want to open them. Move. Aha! A small, sturdy steel plated safe fitted with a combination tumbler and a handle. The safe is closed and appears locked. Dial shows Arabic numbers, numerals 0 through 50 printed on the perimeter in increments of 10. Used paper on safe. So, there's uh, no, um, the, the, the last digit was 86, um, and the dial went from 1 to 50. Not sure how that works. Inside the safe is a leather case. The case contains solid, solid ivory oval, approximately 3 inches in long dimension, attached to a heavy gold chain. The clasp of the chain is broken. A board of some sort has been etched into the ivory. Pick up the contents of the safe. We have found it. Uh, so I'm guessing it's 12 pounds, four shillings, two pennies. Oops, sorry, hold um, An ivory oval, watch me three inches in long dimension attached to a heavy gold chain, clasp is broken, a bird of some sort has been etched into the ivory. The pendant is unexpectedly light in weight. A piece of solid ivory this size should be almost twice as heavy. Close inspection reveals sliding panels on the sides. When moved, they cause the pendant to open. It has a piece of high quality stationery folded several times. The letter reads, Dear Anna, as my death approaches, I wish to atone in a small way for the grievous wrong that has been done to you. I played a part in that wrong, and I beg your forgiveness if you should ever want to legally establish your true relation as Paul Brumwell's mother. This testament and a good solicitor will help. You will risk incurring the wrath of Lord Brumwell should the truth be made known. Tread carefully, my dear, and forgive me. I, Dr. Theodore Smithson, longtime friend and physician to the Brumwell family, delivered a male child on 24 May 1878 at the Brumwell Manor. The mother of that child, later named Paul, was Anna Carraway, a house servant. The father of the child was Lord Bromwell himself. I participated in the conspiracy to make London society and the world think that Paul was in fact the legitimate child of the childless Lady Bromwell. Anna was retained as a wet nurse and later a nanny to the boy. When it became clear that the child had become attached to her, she was cruelly dismissed with the warning that if she ever told the truth of the matter, she would be destroyed by the Bromwell power. My hope is that I have finally done the right thing. I regret that it's taken my impending death to force me to action. This confession is witnessed by my solicitor, Percival Hinchcliffe. Signed, Dr. Theodore Smithson. Boom, indeed. Let us save this game. Boom. And now, I believe, I, oh yeah, I have to move the, <laughs> move the chair back. <clears throat> I believe we now have everything. I believe now we can go to Bromwell's Manor and rub this in his face. Bromwell had her killed to get the letter back. Or someone at Bromwell Manor. I don't know if it was Bromwell. Wait for Watson. Jeez, really? Alright. Um, 
this, everything points to this. Uh, um, Sarah was killed because she was the wrong person. It's supposed to be Anna. Anna, who is dead, is captured, not sure. Um, because uh, she was the actual mother of Lord Bromwell's child. Um, might be the wife, Yuan says. Very good point. Uh, we'll find out. But we're going to confront some people. See what happens. Unless, of course, we have to do some arbitrary hoop jumping. I'm pretty sure this is it. Oh, yeah. I can borrow. Been a while. Hey, we're back. We've uncovered the clue. Uh, use bell pull. His lordship is still indisposed. Will you speak to Lady Bromwell? Oh, yes. Thank you. If you give me your car, Mr. Holmes. I'll find out if the lordship can see you. Oh, she'll see me. Behavior seems to improve upon acquaintance. Lady Bromwell will see you. Please enter. Do, do. Please wait here. Her leadership will summon you. Um, I am curious, though. We did have the, uh, the ashtray here. That actually might have been um, the taxidermist. Now I think about it. I don't think anything about smoking habits. I'm just going to go on. Oh, I can't go in. Oh, man. Enter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mr. Holmes, what can I do for you? We have a letter that I believe Lord Bromwell will be very interested in seeing. You're becoming quite tiresome, Mr. Holmes. If you'll give me the letter, I will see that Lord Bromwell gets it in all due course. This letter is very important. I insist that I see Lord Bromwell in person. The letter is written by the late Dr. Smithson. Dr. Smithson? Oh, my. I... I... Perhaps you should see Lord Bromo after all. He is beyond the double doors in his study. Good! Good! Mm. Biatch? Open doors. Yes, thank you, Watson. Come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'll just give you the definition to see Robert Park. Yeah, good. <laughs> give me a moment to collect my thoughts, gentlemen, then you shall have my full attention. No, I. I Sure. I'm going to look around your room while you're doing that. I want to ask you a gentlemen. This, I suspect, will not be a cordial interview. You don't have to pretend to be friends, do we? Quite right, Mr. Bromwell. The direct approach is generally more satisfying. I am doubtless aware of the purpose for a visit. You're making a nuisance of yourself, disturbing me in this way. I don't know why you fellows can't mind. Do not waste my time with trivial prevarications, sir. A young woman's life is at stake. A woman whom I have reason to believe was once very dear to you. Who? Anna Carraway? Never. I barely knew. She... Resistance is useless, Lord Bromwell, because I am bored. I have Dr. Smithson's letter. It contains sufficient testimony for any court to convict you of the heinous crime. Smithson was an idiot. I can prove he was delirious. He was in love. He was insane. He knew nothing about my cease and desist, sir. Three innocent people are dead. Robert Hunt is in custody and will surely hang. Likewise, George Blackwell. And you, sir, are responsible for these five deaths as if you had personally put a bullet in their brains. Will you see Anna Carraway, the mother of your child, dead as well? Smithson tried to ruin me, ruin my reputation, and that bungler Blackwell, and Hunt, the moron. I'm surrounded by incompetence and hopeless lunatics. Hopeless lunatics. I should have done it myself. I, I was a fool. I have destroyed the only thing I ever loved. Do you know where Hunt has taken Anna? Thank you, Watson. No, have you tried his flat? We don't know where he lives. He has a place in Lambeth Road, number 252. Will you come with us to Scotland Yard, Lord Bromwell? Give me the dignity of turning myself in, if you would, Mr. Holmes. Nah, sure. I'm gonna steal your shit. A large painting hides the military decor of the room. Yodan know, mentions that uh, loving quality, writing quality, and I agree. The um, uh, uh, it's actually. I mean, I'm stumbling over words just because it's. I'm reading text, and, and there's a certain time limit I have to read it in, so I'm reading it quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's so easy to read. There's such an emotive quality. Um, uh, Watson and Holmes's voices are really coming so strongly in here. It's just really good writing. A large boardroom table surrounded by padded leather chairs. 
The shield bears the scars of combat. It is like the souvenir of some ancient battle. A Persian sword is twin rests on the other side of the shield. These heavy wooden doors are securely locked. I got a hammer. I have a hammer. And a hammer in the morning. No, I can't do that. I don't think I actually can do anything in this room. Wait, I'm locked? I'm locked in the room. <laughs> Great. He locked me in. Oh, you fucker. Room of great aging characters in that Watson. It's almost as if we step back into the Conqueror's time. Indeed, Holmes. Cool. I get in here. I believe Lord Brumwell knows the game is lost, Watson. It is time to pay the piper. If you don't mind, I reserve my sympathy for someone who is more deserving of it. God, nice, Watson. Nice. All right. Uh, do 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 do. How do I get the fuck out of this room? Pick up sword. Open door, nope. Open door, nope. All right, you know what? I'm so close to the end here. I just want to know how to get the hell out of this room. <laughs> Is this such a weird thing? Why am I locked in? It, it, it's... Into the book. Yeah, really. If this guy had a typewriter here, this would be so much easier. And yet, here we are. There's a typewriter in every room, so I can throw them through doors. Because that's clearly what typewriters are used for. Alright. Law offices. Take it further. That's a different lock. I thought we had talked to that lawyer previously. It's a different lawyer. Um, we're locked in. We have to get quickly for a save Lord Bromwell for himself. We're certain to find a key in the room somewhere, though it's likely to be well hidden. Uh, I have to move the Persian sword. That's weird. Hard to click. I guess I have to open. These up doors? No. Uh, do I have to move both person swords? I want to open the door. Wait, no, seriously, I heard a click. Oh, okay. I didn't read through everything. Move the Persian sword, which then opens the painting, which reveals a safe, which has a key. Who makes this room? Unexpectedly, Lord Bromwell has not locked his safe. It is perhaps absent-minded, carelessness, or distracted by other business, like being a murderer. Miscellaneous legal documents and a small brass key are in evidence. Pick up. And it's a safe. I'll take the legal documents too. That's cool. No, I guess it's just a key. Use small brass key on the doors. Oh, hey, Zanny. We were right near the end. You had a good time. We've just confronted. I heard it all. I knew it would come to this. Lies, deceit, murder. Where will it end? His lordship left the study in a hysterical state. He said it would never be taken alive, that he would do anything away with himself rather than suffer humiliation and exposure. I don't know what I'll do without him. We will try to find Lord Bradwell and prevent him from doing anything rash. Do you have any idea where he would have gone? No, I have no idea. Please find him. I don't know what I'll do without him. We are on our way, my lady. Um, so to get you up, Zanny, um, we have found the nefarious murderer, Lord Bradwell. Um, He said he's going to turn himself in, then locked us in the room. We just got out of the room. Um, we have to go find him. He's probably at the flat of 
the guy he hired to murder people because he's a douche. Oh, there he is. Whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, I found him. Please stop him. I guess we're going that way. Action. Oh my gosh. He's going to kill himself. No. No. He's got a book tied to his leg. Oh no. Dolms dives in. The best action 1992 software can make. And there's the paddle boat. Oh my. Brahma was a bad sort, but I hate to say anyone died that way. I'm glad you didn't succumb to the same fate. I was beginning prayer when you didn't surface such a long time. I stayed down as long as I could. It was just too dark and murky under the water to find him. Such a waste of life. Yes, indeed, Watson. We must focus our attention on the case before us as we lose yet another life. Anna Caraway is still missing. Quite so, Holmes. So, um, to also catch you up, Azani, that is now the sixth person to have died in this case. This, people are just dying left and right in this case. It's... A lot of death for a Sherlock Holmes mystery, I'm going to be honest. Usually it's a person, maybe a couple, but there's so much death in this game. So many people died. All right, we're looking for the last flat. Robert Hunt's flat. This should be... Well, that last one's a final confrontation. This is probably a final confrontation. She's not here. Damn it! <laughs> okay. We will find this woman someplace. Uh, all right. This mirror serves as the front of a small cabinet or medicine chest. Open it! Look inside. The medicine chest contains a few patents, nostrums, some liver pills, a badger hair shaving brush, shaving soap, and a straight razor of extraordinary sharpness. Uh, sure, pick it all up, because it's a metro game. Nothing, okay, fine. Well, that was, that was fun. A common ceramic pitcher conveniently used for carrying water from a sink. The pitcher is perfectly aligned, spaced equidistant from the bowl as the bowl is from the towel. A wet porcelain shaving or washing bowl is clean and in good condition. The bowl is perfectly aligned at space between the pitcher and the towel. A green cotton face towel, neatly folded and arranged. The towel is perfectly aligned at space between the bowl as the bowl is from the pitcher. The guy's a bit fastidious. Put a towel. Pick it up. Pick up stuff. There's stuff in there. No. Stuff in the bowl. No. Stuff in the pitcher. No. Okay. Fireplace. Mixed among ashes of the fireplace were the remains of several cigarettes. The tobacco used in them is an exotic blend of Turkish and Balkan varieties. Those are the cigarettes we found in the mansion. It's Robert Hunt's. Okay. Now it's all starting to fit together. That's the obvious one. A sturdily built chest similar in size and design to those issued the Royal Navy recruits when they take on the Queen's shilling and go to sea. Open it. Look inside. Two pullovers, some folded underclothing, and a few shirt collars occupy the left side of the trunk. These garments share space with a few cheap pamphlets. The literature pertains to mysticism and astrology. The right side is empty. The inside depth of the chest does not conform to the outside dimensions. A false bottom is a possibility, though cursory examination does not reveal the method of opening it. That's interesting. Chamber pot. Well, that's going to find some evidence there. A white porcelain chamber pot decorated with a floral pattern appears in its traditional place. The exterior of the pot is spotlessly clean. The interior is about one third full of half, half penny pieces. Which is a nice way of saying. Pick up the chamber pot. The yeah, asphalt. Yeah, right. Drawerless nightstand serves a single function in the hunt's decor. It's a surface for a small book dressed on. Well, let's do a small book. 
A buckram bound book displays no title on its spine. A bookmark of some sort peeks out from between closed covers. Pick up the book. Cold is handmade, the bed is made of solid oak. Dust is blown in through the open window and accumulated near the pillows. Super danger music. Okay, let's talk to Watson. What are your initial impressions in the room, Watson? It's snug, comfortable, and contrary to expectation, nicely appointed. Well, this is room, tell us about Robert Hunt. Your question is a bit previous. Previous, Holmes? I have to examine the room more thoroughly before I venture an opinion. Ask me a bit. All right, Watson, Holmes, observe first, deduce later. The smell of Hunt's tobacco pervades the room, Watson. Do you recognize the pungent odor? A most singular smell indeed, Holmes. It is the same stench we encountered at Lord Bromwell's mansion. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what to do with this chest. There's no other way to kind of uh, move the chest, pick up the chest. Pick up the contents of the chest. Use hammer on chest. Good plan. Um, Zanny, you're probably new to this, but um, I have the original uh, clue book uh, for this game, um, and I have been using it liberally to get through these last little nitpicking pieces um, because I have a lot of games to get through, and I want to kind of just skim through. So let's jump down to. We gotta be near the end here. Uh, yeah, I, I have no shame about using this dent blues. Uh, examines the book. He opens the book. I have to open the book. I thought I did that, but alright. The book is a handwritten diary or journal. These pages and writing them are dated. The dates are not consecutive. The writing is almost illegible. Hunt's handwriting is as bad as a certain physician of my intimate acquaintance. It's a lot of meandering bilge about the alignment of the planets and the sun being in the seventh house. Every so often, a, a time and date appear along with some scribbling. It's like an appointment book. Wait a moment. Here, in the last page, it says, Mercury's in retrograde. A good day for something or other. Then, take R to Rose and finally CLB. LB must be Lord Brumwell, but who is Rose? I think it may be Madame Rosa. Uh, something flew back here. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's the psychic. Oh, hold on. Did you want to... Wait, wait. Stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop, Yes, that was Shade at Watson. That was definitely Shade at Watson. <clears throat> bookmark. I just realized I was walking out that that bookmark was a little too visible. Bookmark is actually a claim ticket. Number 4450 is made out to Robert Hunt by Jam at Jameson's New and Used Goods Newton, which is the pawn shop. Alright, so we have Madame Rosa's and pawn shop. <clears throat> Still not how to get to the thing there, but uh, we got a couple leads right now. Uh, pawn shop's right here, so let's do that first. Inventory, give pawn tickets to Nigel Jameson. Thank you. And then he goes to the back door and tries to escape and kills himself. Ah, no. That'd be 20 quid. Really? Really? What'd I get? What'd I get? What'd I get? Tarot cards. The bottom of the box underneath the tarot card sits a small ornate key. 
Okay, let's go to Metamorosa first. I think that key might be for the chest in some way. But, first we go to Common Gardens. Da, da, Golden Garden, sorry, singular. Metamorosa. And again, this is a game that uh, definitely expects you to remember it because, like, if you recall, last time I saw Anna Rosa, I was back, we were doing darts at the pub, which was six hours ago. So. I luckily remembered this because I, I double checked these things. And there's nobody here. Flickering light emitted by this green glass globe barely limits the work table of the desk in which it sits. Drawer is closed and locked. Use tarot cards on desk drawer. Okay. A deck of antique tarot cards. Oh, there's key. Ah. Use. All right. Small brass key looks new and unused. It's probably a duplicate key to be used in case the riches are lost. So use brass key on just drawer. No. Made of mahogany, desk is aged through the wear well cared for. That's a grand one. Miscellaneous and random collection of pamphlets, books, magazines, and two penny tracks, mostly on mysticism, spiritualism, and reincarnation. Prominent exceptions to this theme are tales of Edgar Allan Poe and the Arabian Nights. Yeah, I, I definitely love this old style. So good, so evocative. The crystal ball captures and reflects the flickering light supplied by the candles and the gas fixture above the table. The effect provides a little mystery to an otherwise ordinary room. The staircase appears to lead to a lofter bedroom. The rickety conditioning steps, however, and the thick layer of dust in them suggests that no one has visited upstairs in some time. This well-used chair appears to serve the palmist's clients, so should they seek fortune, good news, and loved ones, or fame. Despite the palmist's administrations, there's little doubt that most of them stand up disappointed. Made of purple tinted tallow, which has been scented with vanilla extract, this candle produces little light and a hideous smell. Hardened wax is broken around the brass base of the candle holder. The base itself seems to be loose and sets slightly away from the column to which it is attached. Huh. Pick up the candle. Move the candle. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! Ha 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 ha! Medium-sized fireproof box with brass fittings is securely locked and bolted to the wall. Use key on box. Open box. It's locked. Use key on box. Pick up. Pick up box. No. Move box. Uh, they're talking about Owlboy in the chat. Um, I haven't played it, but it looks really good. If you'll excuse the expression once, and I can't see a bloody thing in here. Your pupils will soon adjust, Holmes. Be patient. We're in luck, Watson. Madam is out in Maggie House Call or swilling a large gin, more like. Your tarot cards will make interesting reading, Holmes, but let's take advantage of her absence. My thought precisely. The situation is dire, Watson. I'm prepared to do more than flirt with the illegality to save a blameless young woman's life. I'm very glad to hear it, Holmes, because we are already guilty of breaking in and <laughs> Okay, well, maybe this, maybe this other candle moves, too. Despite its size, the candle provides precious little light to the gloomy client where the clomus receives her clients. Purple wax is pulled and hardened around the brass base of the candle holder. Okay. Um... You to do so close to the end. 
Um, I just want to get this part finished. So let's skim back. In retrospect, I probably should bookmark this. Um, I did not think that. I didn't decide to using it quite this much. Uh, but, you know, no, no shame, just more wasn't thinking through. Um, I think when I'm done with this, I probably will actually bookmark this and save it so if I play this again, I have much easier access to all this stuff. But in the meantime, can I scroll through here? Regency Theater, I think I'm actually to the front. No, oh, okay, I missed, I missed something. I just hold on to me. I just get the TOC. Okay. Madam Rose, second readings, page 46. Okay. Use the ornate key on the desk drawer, then pick up the silver key inside. I did that. I did that. Okay. Hold on. Oh, that's a small brass key. That's the ornate key. Motherfucker. All right. Uh. Open desk drawer. Pick up silver key. Inventory. Use silver key, which looks gold, on the strong box. I have so many keys. It's like the sixth key I've got in this game. A folded piece of fine parchment lies in the bottom of the strong box. A wax seal has been broken. I'll pick it up. This small piece of paper appears to be a receipt for rental of some property down at Savoy Street Pier. There's a small note attached. It reads, Rosa, please keep us in a safe place. R-H. Well. So I will stay. Um, I really thought uh, confronting Lord Bromwell was going to be like the big finale. But we have an interesting... False finish happening here. Um, so there's a whole kind of separate thing going on. Um, which is not fine. I mean, again, it extends gameplay. It makes it interesting. I'm just more intrigued. I thought that was like, we had the thing. And we didn't have the thing yet. The batter barrels are filled with used nails, scraps, scrap metal, and wood. Perhaps dock workers use them as trash receptacles. They are too heavy to move. Because I have moved a lot of barrels in this game. So thank you for stopping me from doing that. The window has been boarded up from the inside. Peering through the cracks in the wood reveal a small room in which sits a woman on a chair. She is bound with rope and gagged. Over her head a keg of black powder is suspended. The fuse of which rests close nearby and below a burning candle. The fuse is also attached to the doorknob. So when open, the fuse will raise into the candle flame and light. Okay, and the also the candle burns down low enough to light the fuse. These games have a tendency to cheat real bad near the end, so save real quick. Open the door is locked. Okay, uh, inventory. Use typewriter. No, not typewriter. Use hammer. It's hammer on a window. You can't do that. Why not? This caraway is attached to a fiendishly clever booby trap, Watson. The situation is dire. We must act decisively. Your detective powers have surges, harvested wealth well home, but the circumstance demands a different approach. You have grasped my meaning in an instant, Watson. Which is what? What is a different approach? What is the different approach? I 
Iron Barb. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, more for a zany stick than anything else. Uh, you will see the iron bars all the way back here. It's like literally the first thing we picked up. Sure. <laughs> Action sequence. I let the fuse Watson ship shortly or we're in for it. You give us caraway, I'll deal with the bomb. I wouldn't recommend it, Watson. Leave it for the police. Watson, Watson. And leave his mess to explode extensively. I can't do that, Holmes. No! Watson! You saved my life. I'm sorry your friend didn't. His hat! No! No! Watson! My hat. Holmes' his mouth is moving, but there's no text on the screen. I, I am profoundly sorry. Nonsense, Holmes. It was my decision to try and defuse the bomb. You can't take responsibility for my folly. Very generous of you, old friend. What happened? As must be obvious to the world's greatest detective, I failed to stop the burning fuse from reaching the black powder. Just when I saw a dire situation had become, I saw a trap door on the floor. I jumped inside and saved my life. Oh, okay. And a good thing too. I would have been seriously displeased had you been injured. That's Holmes. As would I, I'm sure. Good day, gentlemen. Very good of you to come. Let's speak softly so we don't disturb the boy. Your spirits seem much improved since we last met, Mr. Froginson. Your reputation for perspicacity is not undeserved, Mr. Holmes. I profound thanks for your efforts on behalf of Miss Caroline. I presume that Dr. Smithson's letter was all you had hoped it would be. Indeed, Mr. Holmes. As you see, I have already been able to reunite mother and son on the strength of it. I am very gratified to hear it. Justice has been served. What will become of Lady Bromwell? She received word last night that the unhappy woman expired from apoplexy. Perhaps this for the best. Seven deaths! What are your plans, Miss Carraway, if I may ask? Of course you may, Mr. Holmes. You and Dr. Watson saved my life, after all. I will continue singing at the opera. Paul will come to live with me on Broadhill Street. We shall try to be very happy. As for Miss Caruso, we shall have to see. Very wise, I say. I know, of course, that your sister's killer has been convicted. Thanks to you and Dr. Watson, I understand. It is, however, a small consolation. Somehow, if you're responsible for Sarah's death. Nonsense, Miss Carraway, if you'll excuse me for saying so. Blackwood had no idea the pen to contain the letter he was looking for. He blundered into its theft, and he will pay for his error with his life. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Watson, we should take our leave. A moment more of your time, gentlemen, if I may. Dr. Watson, I have read your accounts of Mr. Holmes's exploits, and I presume that you have kept a record of his case as well. I have indeed. I wonder if I might prevail upon you to withhold or at least postpone the publication of your journal for the sake of the boy and his mother. I will consider it, Mr. Farlington. Then I bid you good day. Considering three innocent lives were lost. Seven. Indeed, and more's the pity. But we did unravel a muddle that Flummox scuffed in the yard. We apprehended the two vicious criminals. And best of all, we reunited a mother with her son. I would like to have seen Lord Brumwell in the dock, but he has submitted himself to a higher authority. May they all receive their just rewards. Amen to that, Holmes. I'm glad it's over. This was a most peculiar and troubling case. It was a long time before I realized that all of our investigations were related. Sarah's murder, 
Connor's abduction and the killing of Frederick Gardner and Moorhead were in a sense all the same crime. I suspect that you knew the pendant was the crux of the case much earlier than I. I think that is a just and a succinct summation, Watson. Amazing, Holmes. Should I live 100 years, I'm sure I shall never meet your equal. My thanks, Watson. But don't be too certain. There is a master criminal who thinks he is already more than a match for me. No doubt we shall have to deal with him in time. And there we go. Um, <laughs> it just it just stopped. It just crashed. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, Brent Campbell. Um, so that was surprisingly at the end there. Uh, uh, the Lost Files, Sherlock Holmes. Um, uh, it's gonna it, form a final thoughts here uh, in the chat. Uh, you and said that it, um, it was an extra bit of fun and tasteful. It's so enjoyable. It's a good example of. Uh, what they like to call a thick ending. Um, not so sure we have something like Kingdom Hearts 3, which is fantastic, but then just wouldn't honestly end. And it's actually three or four hours of just refusing to end. Um, and I've heard that about uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, so that's not surprising. Whereas this one is more of like, it was a false finish, but then there was another maybe 30 minutes of gameplay at the end. And it was, aside from some luckiness with um, the, the, the uh, getting the lock and figuring out how to use the iron bar, which I probably would have brute forced anyway. Another like half an hour gameplay. It's a nice little bit at the end, and so it's a good kind of solid ending. Um, uh, 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 and perform suggests that uh, uh, I mean, a death counter for the next game, which <laughs> is true. Seven deaths. Wow, that is a lot of death. Um, I will say I don't think many of the other Holmes games have that many deaths per case. Um, uh, we shall see. Uh, maybe the Awakens does. I don't know. I have to I'll have to double check that when it gets there. But anyhow. Um, the last bit on there was definitely uh, a reference to uh, Professor Moriarty, um, and that, again, canonically holds true. Um, uh, Holmes actually famously met uh, Moriarty, or confronted him, I should say, um, in The Final Problem, which is set in 1891. Uh, so that'd be three years after the date of this case. So, again, um, I've said this several times, but I want to reiterate, um, this is actually clearly written by... Uh, a person or a team of people who were uh, Sherlockians. Um, they were definitely fans of the canon. They had done their research, um, and it, it just really holds together well. And I say that because some of the games I'm going to look at after this are not great at that, and I want to kind of dig into those as well. Um, uh, but uh, this is the end of The Lost uh, Case of Sherlock Holmes, um, and now we know why it was lost, too. Uh, uh, so after this, um, I do have more games in the Sherlock Holmes vein to be played. Um, the next one is going to be um, one or maybe two of the Consulting Detective series. Um, and that's going to be interesting because um, the Consulting Detective games are actually some of the best Sherlock Holmes board games you could find. Um, they're really, really fantastic. Great cooperative games. Very, very simple in terms of rules. Very hard in terms of case structure. Um, and there was an attempt in the early 90s to do full motion video versions of them on CD-ROM. Um, so uh, next time we play, you can do the best experience of high quality 1990s basic cable acting and special effects. Uh, so it's going to be a lot less of me talking, more of other people talking, which may not be great. But um, those there are three remastered cases out. One I know the answer to. I've played relatively recently. So there are two I've never played. Um, so I'm probably going to play at least one of those to show you guys what that is like. And also to give you a chance to see um, what the consulting detective experience is like. Because actually it's pretty faithful to the board game in all honesty. And they're, they're actually, again, reasonably hard. Um, but uh, you can solve a case in about two and a half hours. So you probably just do that, knock it out in one night. Um, so I'll probably next week's episode... And then after that, um, we're going to start getting into the, the Frogwares canon, which is a lot of the Sherlock Holmes games of the past 15 years. Um, so we'll be going into those later. But, so, but uh, next week, um, Consulting Detective, the week after that, start doing the Frogwares games. Uh, so thank you guys for, for hanging out. Uh, I really appreciate it. And as always, I'll talk to you later.